Good evening, all. Just to, as we begin, just to say a word of welcome to Brian Caulfield from the Knights of Columbus, um, who's here this evening, to give a brief presentation and uh, make available to us the uh, veneration of a first-class relic of Father McKibney. Um, just on behalf of um, the faculty, Father Kali, our rector, and everyone, welcome, Brian. And um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to um, our distinguished deacon, Jim DeVasto, who worked and collaborated with Brian for many years down in New Haven, Connecticut. So once again, welcome, Jim, all up to you. Thanks. Thank you, Father. Appreciate it. As Father alluded to, uh, during my 37 years of uh, career at the Knights of Columbus Supreme Office, happily, uh, 17 years of those years were spent in collaborating with my very good friend and brother colleague, Brian Caulfield. I started there in 1981, so do the math. Um, but Brian started in 2001, and when he first came to us, he was made the managing editor of Columbia Magazine. Some of you may be very familiar with that monthly magazine. And Brian was, he was the day-to-day -day kind of guy. You know, he put it all together, and then the officers would take a look at it and throw this article out that they didn't want that month. They put another one in, they want this, that. The managing editor is the guy who has to deal with all of that. Uh, so he did that until 2006, at which time he was then appointed the communications specialist for the Supreme Knight in the Supreme Knight's office, a very sensitive task, which he still continues with even today. But his big claim to fame is that in 2011, Brian was appointed the vice postulator for the cause of beatification for now blessed Father Michael J. McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus. And it was his great uh, privilege to actually investigate two possible miracles, one of which he's going to speak about this evening, which is actually in large part responsible for uh, the Holy Father and those who collaborate with him about the causes of saints to say, yes, Father Michael McGivney is a blessed. And so without further ado, I hand the microphone over to my good friend and colleague, Brian Caulfield. Brian. Thank you very much, Father, and thank you very much, Deacon uh, Jim. It's quite an honor to be here and a privilege, and I'm very, very happy to be among you. Um, I think Father McGivney is certainly for seminarians someone uh, as a role model, really, that you can look up to. Uh, he's one of only four U.S.-born males who have been beatified. And that may sound surprising, uh, because we have so many saints who have been associated with the United States, such as the North American martyrs um, born in France, um, uh, St. John Neumann, born in Bohemia, and uh, a number of others. Um, so the four blessed who were actually born in the U.S. and now are blessed are fairly recent. Um, there's uh, Father Stanley Rother, out of Oklahoma City, um, who actually was a missionary in Guatemala and was, um, became a martyr there under the, I guess, the junta or the regime. And uh, uh, as a vice postulate, I say he didn't need a miracle because he was to be beatified because, you know, the uh, martyrs don't need miracles, rightfully so. And uh, the other one is uh, Father Solanus Casey, a Capuchin, I think we have a Capuchin here, yes, and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, beatified, um, I think in 2018, I think Rother was 2017, he was 2018, and then in 2019 is often the overlooked uh, a religious brother uh, who was uh, made a, uh, a beatified, and uh, he was a De La Salle brother, which is close to my heart because I, I was educated by De La Salle brothers uh, in New York City uh, at La Salle Academy. And uh, so he was made in 2018 or 2019. And then uh, in October 31st, Halloween, um, during COVID in 2020, uh, Father McGivney was uh, raised to the 
honors of uh, being beatified um, in the Di Archdiocese of Hartford, where he was resident and where he died um, at St. Uh, Joseph's Cathedral. Now, of course, during COVID, we could only have 100 people present in the cathedral by you know, order of the state government. And, uh, but we had three cardinals uh, show up, Cardinal Tobin, who represented the Holy Father, uh, Cardinal Dolan of New York, and Cardinal O'Malley of, uh, of Boston. And uh, so it was quite a, a joyous occasion. Um, I got to receive from Cardinal Tobin the decree in Latin that the Holy Father uh, issued for the beatification uh, as vice postulator. Um, the postulator in Rome was not able to come because of all the COVID restrictions. So I, <laughs> I was able to kind of represent uh, the cause in that way. So as, uh, as Father mentioned, we have a first class relic, which is a bone relic uh, taken from the bodily remains of Father McGivney. His remains are in a sarcophagus at St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, that's where he founded the Knights of Columbus in 1882. And uh, he was initially buried in, uh, in his hometown of Waterbury, but uh, for the centennial of the Knights, so we received permission, it was before my time at the Knights, but in uh, 1981, his body was exhumed and eventually brought to uh, uh, St. Uh, Mary's on uh, what we call Founders Day, March 29th, uh, 1882. But I want to kind of start the, uh, the body of my address here, uh, talking about another date, Monday, February 6th. Sounds familiar. It was a momentous day in the life of Father McGivney and in the history of the Knights of Columbus. And I'm not talking about my being here giving this talk. Today is Monday, February 6th, right? It just so happens that on February 6, 1882, Father McGivney uh, performed two uh, groundbreaking, amazing uh, duties as a parish priest. And uh, so important were they that in the official biography, parish priest, and I will leave this for the library. Uh, Jim said you already have a copy, but this will be a second copy. So. Uh, a couple of pages are devoted just to February 6th at the beginning. And why? Because on February 6th, Father McGivney uh, left the parish precincts and went to the probate court in New Haven in order to uh, profess um, guardianship of a 19-year-old teenager from a Catholic family, the Downs family in New Haven, who had fallen upon hard times and then uh, Mr. Downs, who ran a newsstand and, uh, you know, book, uh, book sales, a uh, very prominent uh, personality in New Haven at the time, uh, he passed away, and he left absolutely nothing to his family. He had lost a lot of money, and there was kind of an economic crash a few years before, and he never dug out of it. Um, unfortunately, maybe as men are, and certainly men of that day, he never told his wife that they were you know, in hard financial times. And she was kind of surprised to find that uh, upon his death that there really was nothing to be left for the children. So in those days, of course, you know, we're li they're living in a day of kind of anti-Catholic, know-nothing. Uh, you know, if you know your church history, the know-nothing movement, very anti-Catholic. Um, you know, Catholics were kind of uh, second-class citizens. Um, you know, they were immigrants, especially the Irish at that time, had come over in the 19, 1840s, you know, during the, uh, uh, during the famine, the potato famine in Ireland. And uh, so what they would do if a family, and they had, I think, seven children um, in the family, the oldest was, you know, able to run the, news, the newsstand, he took that over. And the other children were able to, you know, family members chipped in what you had to do at that time for the city was to uh, guarantee that a family without a breadwinner would be able to provide for their minor children uh, because they didn't want them to become vagrants or delinquents or uh, you know, things of that sort. So they would be provided for. And uh, so they provided you know, a assurance, a monetary assurance for all the children except 
Alfred Downs, who was 19 at the time. And the big question was, what will happen with Alfred? You know, will he be taken from his family, given to a nice Protestant family, um, and thereby lose, you know, access to the Catholic faith, of course, or put into an institution, which again, run by the Protestants of the time. And uh, it was a danger to the faith, and it was taken very seriously in those days, of course, uh, as today. Um, so Father McGivney, you know, he was very close with the Downs family. They were parishioners. Uh, the, one of the daughters in the family was the organist at St. Mary's, so he knew them very well. So he uh, did not have the money. It was $1,500, which in 1882 I hazard even to think what that would be in today's money, but uh, $50,000 or more, I don't know. Um, basically enough to get Alfred you know, to his majority and uh, maybe 21 years old or he can take care of himself, hopefully. Um, so he didn't have that money, but he you know, asked people he knew had money uh, in the parish and who might be interested in doing this kind of uh, financial uh, you know, staking uh, the funds. So, he, he found someone in the parish who was willing to uh, provide the $1,500. Father McGivney uh, went down to the probate court. Now, this is a day when, you know, priests, Catholic priests were not often seen, you know, outside the church, outside the parish, you know, precincts, um, just because, you know, there was so much anti-Catholic bias, you know, you'd never know what, you know, might happen uh, to him. And uh, so he went down to the probate court in New Haven uh, when the judge asked, you know, who will provide for the, uh, for the maintenance, so to speak, uh, of Alfred Downs. Father McGivney stood up and he said that he would, you know, he would provide the $1,500 given by a good Catholic donor of New Haven. And, uh, and Alfred was able to return to his family. You know, it wasn't like Father McGivney adopted him or anything. It's just he if anything happened, if, if Alfred got in trouble or whatever, you know, they would go to Father McGivney and say, you know, okay, you know, you got to watch over this kid and make sure he doesn't get into trouble. So that was in the morning of February 6th, 1882. And as the book relates, uh, there was a huge snowstorm the day before. So, you know, the uh, snow drifts were high. And, you know, Jim and I know New Haven very well, uh, going from the court across the, uh, the green um, over to uh, St. Mary's is, uh, you know, a bit of a walk and you know, freezing cold temperatures. And that evening he was having a meeting with his uh, newly named Knights of Columbus. This was the first meeting where they actually met under the name Knights of Columbus. So this is 141 years ago. And uh, they, he had started bringing men together the year before in October. And some of them wanted to you know, go under the name of the Catholic Foresters, which is already a uh, established um, uh, fraternal organization. Uh, but eventually, in a meeting of February 2nd of 1882, they decided that they would establish a new original organization. Uh, Father McGivney wanted Sons of Columbus, uh, but the, uh, you know, the men among them, you know, many of them were uh, World War, no, World War I, Civil War veterans and they wanted some sort of ceremonial and uh, a ritual organization. And one of them said, well, Father, you know, we're already sons. You know, we all have fathers, we're sons, but we really want to be knights, you know, to uphold Catholic manhood. And that's why, you know, knights. And some people ask, well, why Columbus? These are all Irishmen. Uh, you know, why would they pick what, you know, we, we see today as a, an Italian, um, Figure, but of course, in 1882, uh, I guess 10 years before the uh, you know 400th year or 500th year of the uh, I guess 400th year of Columbus's uh, discovery of the New World, uh, Columbus was universally recognized as heroic figure, even by the Protestants. And so it was the idea that um, you know they take Columbus as their patron in order to say that, well, you know, as much as the Protestants are ascendant today, America was actually found by a Catholic, and we were here first kind of thing. Um, so that's the reason for the Columbus. So I'm gonna talk really about 
four things, the life and legacy of Father McGivney, uh, the canonization process, uh, the miracle that led to his beatification, and then something uh, for you gentlemen, uh, brothers, um, what you can do to kind of help the cause. And I'm not going to ask you to do anything impossible like perform a miracle or anything, but uh, basically it's joining, you know, the guild. We have membership forms in the back. And uh, so I assume, you know, some of you or most of you know kind of the basic story of Father McGivney. Um, his parents had come over, Patrick and Mary. They actually uh, lived not too far apart in Ireland, but they never met one another there because there was a mountain in between their two towns. So it was hard to get the cows and the sheep over the mountain. Um, so they came over separately uh, and they both settled in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, you know, which at one time in its history was known as the most, most Catholic city in America. I think it has, still has like 13 churches, not as many parishes anymore with consolidation. And uh, just uh, jumping ahead a century or so, when uh, I, there's a plaque there, when the uh, first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, was campaigning in, uh, in 1960, uh, the one town he visited in Connecticut was Waterbury, and no surprise, because it was just known as an enclave for, for Catholics. So Mary and Patrick married. I think they came over in 1848. They married... I think in 1850, Michael was born, first child, and 1852, August 12th, um, 1852, uh, the first of what would become 13 children, um, six of whom uh, survived, you know, seven, uh, you know, died either in childbirth or some time after. Um, so his father was an iron molder. There were many factories uh, at that time in Waterbury, and, uh, you know, the Irish immigrants took the dangerous hard labor jobs you know we're talking the factories with the noxious fumes and all the dangers of you know the, the safety uh, they worked on railroads they worked in the mines um, you know all the jobs kind of that they could get uh, unskilled labor and uh, uh, father mcgivney or michael mcgivney uh, was an intelligent young man when he went to school he already knew how to read his mother was maybe the first uh, homeschooler uh, of her time. Uh, she taught him to read before he went to uh, school. So he was skipped a couple of grades. And then eventually he graduated a few years early at age 13. And uh, he went to work in a uh, spoon factory in Waterbury to help support the family as the oldest, uh, oldest boy, of course. Um, his pastor at uh, Immaculate Conception in Waterbury uh, was uh, Father Thomas Hendrickin. And Father Hendrickin was uh, quite a, uh, a good holy priest, and eventually, a few years later, he would be uh, named the first Bishop of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, his remains are there in the, in the cathedral. Um, I visited there, and I actually brought this relic and placed it on top of the sarcophagus and took a picture and... Uh, you know, put it on social media or someone else did it for me, and basically saying the remains of, uh, of Father Hendrickin are finally reunited with his most prominent student and, and pupil, uh, Father Michael McGivney. And uh, so Father Hendrickin was sort of like the Pied Piper, if I can use that term in a positive sense. Um, when Michael was 16, he prevailed upon uh, Mr. McGivney uh, that, you know, your son has a vocation and you have an obligation before God uh, to let him pursue it, um, even if it means, you know, more financial hardship on the family. And, you know, Patrick being a, a good Catholic man and, you know, Mary McGivney, of course, being a pious Catholic mother. So Father Hendrickin wound up bringing seven, seven young men from his parish alone uh, to, uh, they would, went to, Quebec, Canada, you know, Catholic Quebec. There was only one seminary at the time in the U.S. that was St. Mary's, and of course that was, you know, for the theologate. Um, and of course Michael at 16 needed to go through, you know, years of formation, as I'm sure many of you here uh, can sympathize with. Um, so he went to St. Hyacinth in Quebec, 
And uh, you know, he studied uh, the classics, he studied Latin, and uh, you know, English literature, he excelled in all of that. Uh, then one year there, and then he went to um, Our Lady of Angels in uh, Niagara Falls, which was a seminary at the time run by the Vincentians. Now you may know um, uh, Niagara University is still run by the Vincentians, and uh, I visited there with, my, with a colleague of mine uh, uh, just last October, and uh, what we were doing, we were looking for any a place that's still extant that Father McGivney may have known at his time. And there's been so much renovation to the campus, of course, and buildings have been torn down and others have been put up. But the historian, the Vincentian historian, uh, did his research and he showed me uh, one staircase in what used to be the seminary uh, that's not really used anymore, but you know, they think it was preserved because of its, you know, that this would have been where not only Father McGivney, but uh, Father Nelson Baker, also uh, from Buffalo, uh, being proposed for sainthood. Uh, they were not in the same year, but they were there at Niagara at the same, t uh, a Lady of Angels at the same time. So it's amazing that uh, Niagara Falls might have, you know, God willing, uh, two saints who had gone through uh, the seminary there, uh, American saints. So he went to Quebec, then he went to Niagara Falls, um, and then he started at the uh, Grand Seminary in uh, Montreal, run by the Jesuits. Now we're not sure, the historical record is not absolutely clear, but uh, we think perhaps he was thinking of becoming a Jesuit at the time because he was a very bright young man. Um, you know, the Jesuits were known in those days as you know, the premier um, ac uh, academic and intellectual order although I gave this talk at Providence College last week and the Dominicans took great exception to that. Um, but uh, but uh, anyway, he, he was there for a year and then something happened which was very common among families at the time with the Downs family and now with the McGivney family, the father, the breadwinner, passed away. Uh, Patrick McGivney passed away at age 47 um, in the year 1873. So young Michael is 20 years old now. Uh, he leaves seminary before taking his final exams at, uh, in Montreal and comes back to Waterbury for the funeral. And his assumption is that, you know, my seminary days are over, I have to come and support the family. He was the oldest, he was only 20, so there's like six, uh, five or six behind him. And uh, so he's thinking that, so he kind of stays and uh, his sisters uh, come to him, and they were doing domestic work at the time, and they said, you know, we can do that and help support the family. And then the bishop of Hartford, who was a diocese at the time, um, got word, you know, that this stellar student and really good prospect for the priesthood was thinking of not going back to seminary, and uh, he offered what, you know, was kind of rare in those days, which was a, uh, a scholarship. But he said, you're not going back to Montreal and the Jesuits. If we're going to give you a scholarship, you're going to St. Mary's in, in Baltimore. Um, so that's where uh, Michael McGivney went. Um, he was appointed sacristan, um, obviously a position of you know, great responsibility. Uh, and uh, you know, he was known to be meticulous. He was known to be uh, hardworking. And uh, so after four years, then he is ordained at the hands of then Archbishop James Gibbons, later Cardinal, one of the most prominent churchmen in America for half a century or, or something. Uh, I think he was Archbishop of Baltimore till the 1930s or so. Um, so he was ordained and then he took the train up to Waterbury. And he was ordained December 22nd, 1877, um, which is kind of an interesting time of the year to be ordained, uh, right before Christmas. Um, we suspect that maybe there were two ordination classes, like they were so large that they would ordain some in, you know, in, uh, in December and in another, another uh, wave, so to speak, in, in May. So uh, perhaps that's the reason, but we don't have any definite uh, uh, documentation of that. But he gets back to Waterbury um, in time for Christmas Eve Mass, and 
as you can imagine in the old Latin rite, having your first public mass, <laughs> being the Christmas mass in front of your widowed mother and your siblings. It must have been quite a, uh, quite a happy occasion, but also a lot of pressure on the young, uh, the young priest. Um, after the new year, he was assigned by the bishop to St. Mary's Church in New Haven. Um, really a large parish. Um, you know, New Haven at the time was a, uh, of course, Yale University had been there since the 1700s. Uh, started as a divinity school and, you know, now is kind of what it is today, you know, kind of an I Ivy League elite school. Um, New Haven itself was a harbor, you know, port, town, um, you know, had factory town, of course. It was known for, you know, kind of uh, men who came there to, to make it in the world. And uh, so Father McGivney is uh, the curate and with an ailing pastor at the time. And uh, he writes to his former seminary professor, um, says, I have not had a single day off since I came here, um, you know, because the pastor was ailing and he took up so many of the, um, you know, and research shows, you know, from this book that the average age that a priest in Connecticut at that time died around age 40. So, you know, we're talking about going into sick rooms, sick beds, anointing people, overwork, and, uh, you know, no antibiotics and, you know, things of that sort, not knowing perfectly the whole thing about germs and infection. And so COVID-19, I understand you're the, uh, you're the COVID-19 expert here, which uh, kept all the men healthy. Um, so 1877, uh, he's ordained. He takes, you know, to New Haven Parish. Um, one thing he noticed, and, you know, it's, I think we can all recognize that today, that there were more women and children in the pews than men. And uh, he said, well, how do we, you know, bring the men in? How do we interest them? How do we, you know, because I, I come from Irish background. I remember my grandparents and my uncles are like, you know, oh, the wife takes care of the religion for us, you know. And uh, no, this is true. Um, I would hear that and uh, probably the same thing in those days. And, you know, these men worked hard too. So probably Sunday was like, you know, I'm not getting up early to get to mass. And, you know, they had to fast, of course, from midnight, uh, no water or anything back in those days. So, you know, they'd want to get up, have a big breakfast. Oh, I can't go to mass now, honey, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so he said, how do we get the men involved, engaged? How do we get them, you know, to live out their faith in a way, you know, in a masculine way that they will understand and embrace? And that started the idea of this fraternal society. The other uh, thing that he saw was a lot of men, um, Catholic men, in order to get ahead in society, were joining the secret societies, you know, the Masonic societies. Um, obviously, you're a brother Mason, and you have more opportunities. Uh, you know, one brother helps the other kind of thing, get ahead in the world, or you have a business, and all the Masons, you know, go to your, your shop or your business and buy from you, that kind of thing. So he said, well, this is not right. You know, uh, we can't have our Catholic men joining these. We have to give them an equal organization to give, you know, similar benefits or even better benefits. And, you know, we're talking about benefits. We're talking about death benefit, um, you know, because so many, you know, he knew in his own family, he knew in the Downs family, he knew with so many families in his parish that, you know, the men were dying at a, at a young age, leaving many children and a widow. Um, without much. So, um, he wanted to keep Catholic men away from the ban, Masonic societies, to provide equal or better death benefits. Um, so, in 1881, I mean, how long is he at St. Mary's? Three years. He's been ordained not even four years, and this young priest, you know, decides that he's going to gather some of the, what they call the go-ahead men of New Haven, you know, these are men who, like, were lawyers, uh, police constables, um, you know, had kind of a, they weren't working, they weren't the day laborers or manual laborers necessarily, these men were maybe with a little education and, you know, ambition that they were going to make it in the new world uh, despite whatever, you know, despite the prejudice or, you know, they were going to make it. And so he gathered them together and he said, you know, we need to form a fraternal benefit society. Um, that will, uh, you know, bring men together 
And the first two principles in those days were unity and charity. Later, um, you know, fraternity was added, and in 1900, the fourth degree, patriotism uh, was added. Um, so that was the idea. He said, you know, unity so that we may be together to practice charity to those who need us. That was his idea. Very simple, you know, very in keeping with the gospel, but something, you know, it, you know, pe people ask me, like, what is it about Father McGivney? You know, why is he, you know, being lifted so high? And, you know, obviously, at the time his cause was open, there was no one living who knew him. And we do have great grand, uh, not great grand, <laughs> a nephew, grand nephew, great grand nephews, um, and a great grand niece, you know, who look like McGivney. It's, it's amazing. You know, there's no doubt that they're relatives. Um, but why him? And I, I often think, what? He gathered together these men, you know, who were, I mean, th these were, you know, they, they'd gone through the war, the Civil War. They were veterans. You know, they wanted this, uh, this organization to have the ritual and to be, you know, totally masculine and go ahead. You know, they had beards like, you know, you see their pictures, you know, like, uh, you know, the uh, the roar, not the Roaring Twenties, but the, uh, you know, the 1890s, not the gay 90s, we can't say that today, but uh, that, that period. Um, and they listened to him. You know, they were older men, probably 30s and 40s, right? A lot of life experience, a lot of hard knocks, and here's this, you know, this priest coming out of seminary three or four years, and they wanted him to be their leader, actually, you know, when they started forming this organization, they said, you, you know, be, you'd be our supreme knight. And he said, no, that this is a lay organization I'm founding. And that itself was kind of unusual in the day, um, that a priest would kind of cede uh, the authority to, to laymen. Um, and he said, we're related to the church, but we are not an official church organization. We're not under, you know, the, the auspices of, of the bishop. You know, obviously the bishop could close you down or not approve you, but... Uh, you know, it's not a parish organization. It's, uh, it's an independent Catholic lay organization. Kind of novel for the day. And he got blowback, believe it or not, uh, from fellow priests who said, you know, who is this whippersnapper, you know, this Johnny come lately trying to do, you know, this wonderful thing that no one else has been able to do or no one else thought of and this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, he had, uh, as one priest wrote of him after his death, he had... Uh, an ironclad will. You know, he was charitable and humble, but when he had a mission, he had an ironclad will, and he always moved forward. He never moved backward, you know, even with setbacks. I mean, Father McGinley wrote at one point, you know, we have very few letters of his, but this is one where he says, our organization almost fell back dead at one point, you know, after it was founded. Um, so what does that mean? That means that Father McGivney kind of resurrected it and uh, so they formed that organization February 6th, 141 years ago. They were called the Knights of Columbus. And uh, on March 29th, 1882, uh, you know, they had their bylaws, which were approved by the, uh, you know, since they were a business in a sense, an insurance business, a fraternal benefit uh, business, they had to be approved by the legislature of Connecticut. And that came through on March 29th. 1882 and March 29th is when the Knights uh, celebrate annually uh, what we call Founders Day. And uh, so Father McGivney there is, uh, they wanted him to be Supreme Knight. Uh, he said, okay, I'll, I'll be Supreme Secretary. In other words, keep the books. And, uh, you know, we have his parish ledgers and, you know, everything, you know, is, as you can see, every item is you know, accounted for and exact down to the penny. So we know he was very meticulous uh, with money and, you know, the men trusted him and obviously in that sense. But the moment that he saw the organization was on a little firmer footing, uh, he stepped aside as secretary and became um, supreme chaplain. So that's sometimes a, uh, you know, among knights, it's kind of a, a trick question, you know. Uh, who was the first supreme knight of the Knights of Columbus? Oh, of course, Father McGivney. Well, no, actually it wasn't. <laughs> uh, there was uh, another priest who was a Supreme Chaplain for two years uh, before Father McGivney was the second uh, Supreme Chaplain. 
And then from then on, there was a McGivney, two of his bro brothers became priests. And there was a McGivney, a Supreme Chaplain, up until 1932. And then there was a cousin, you know, probably a great cousin or something of the works, up until 1962. So there was a McGivney presence uh, as Supreme Chaplain from, you know, from 19, 1884 until 1962. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, where is our Father Daly here? Um, of course, Bishop Daly was uh, Supreme uh, Chaplain uh, for a number of years. And uh, so moving along, uh, in 1884, I guess, yeah. So really, she's ordained in 77 and 84, seven years. He's at St. Mary's and as the assistant. And then he gets appointed pastor uh, of St. Thomas Church in Thomaston, uh, named after Seth Thomas, the clockmaker, another industrial town about 25 miles north up in the hills uh, in Connecticut. Of course, in those days, 25 miles was quite a distance. So he's going away. And uh, there are two groups of people who, you know, are totally devastated. One are the parishioners. I mean, we have newspaper accounts, uh, even from secular newspapers who covered religious things in those days, um, of people weeping in the pews as he's, you know, announcing that he's been transferred uh, by the bishop. And, uh, you know, his, we have a, a transcription of his final, uh, you know, his, his farewell speech where he says, you know, I, I have been among you for seven years. I hope I have not offended of you. You know, sometimes I may have seemed a little strict, but this was necessary for the discipline of, you know, cohesion of our parish. Um, I have taught your children, uh, you know, catechism and tried to bring them up, you know, in the faith, you know, with the help, obviously, of the parents. Um, I go forth, you know, my heart is absolutely broken at leaving this parish, and I only do it out of obedience to my bishop, and I leave you, you know, with this, uh, you know, memento of his, of his love and his dedication that he poured himself out for them uh, over those seven years. And, um, and of course, the Knights of Columbus is his brother Knights now. The organization is only two and a half years old, um, but uh, they, you know, we have this in the museum that they, they did a, like, memento thing with all the original members, pictures of them, and then, you know, in calligraphy, you know, uh, a, a dedication to Father McGivney and, you know, how much love that they have for him, and he will always be their father. You know, he was our father, they said. So, another thing about Father McGivney is, okay, he goes to Thomaston, and humility, he doesn't take the organization with him. Right? So he never saw himself as absolutely vital to the organization. He goes away, and of course he'll come back for meetings and things like that. But, you know, the, the headquarters and the base of, of the Knights of Columbus stayed in New Haven and at St. Mary's Parish. So I always thought that was an indication of uh, his detachment and his humility. And here's something that he founded, you know, and something that kind of other people looked at him and said, you know, who you know, that's a big uppity guy kind of thing, but that was never in his own mind. In his own mind, he was just doing something according to God's will. So he's up in uh, Thomaston now in uh, 1884, December of 1884. Um, two years later, he gets care of a mission parish in a town three or four miles away, Terryville. And so his Sunday now is like, uh, you know, nine o'clock mass at... at uh, St. Thomas, you know, 1030 Mass at uh, three, three miles away by horse and buggy, most likely, at uh, Terryville, and then back for like a noon Mass or 1130 Mass in, uh, in Thomaston. And uh, not unlike, I guess, a lot of priests do today, you know, covering many parishes. So uh, in 18, uh, 1889, uh, the Russian flu comes from Europe over to America, uh, many people dying, of course. Uh, it's known as the Russian flu of 1889-1890. Um, Father McGivney, you don't know if he actually caught that flu, but he becomes very ill uh, during that time. 
and uh, actually, you know, goes for a cure. He goes to New York to find a cure and goes a couple of places, you know, to, um, you know, for the waters, like to a spa or a resort. But, uh, you know, nothing, nothing uh, helped. So two days past his 38th birthday on August 14th, 1890, uh, he dies in the rectory of, uh, of St. Thomas Church. Uh, you know, obviously, Brother Priest were there. Uh, he received, you know, the last rites and, you know, died in, in, the, in the sacraments of the church. And uh, so they had a funeral mass in Thomaston, and then he, they brought the body by a train down to Waterbury, which is about 10 miles, and uh, he was going to be buried in the you know, where his mother and his father were buried and some of his early siblings, you know, uh, the ones who didn't make it to adulthood. And, uh, you know, newspaper reports, again, it's, it was the largest uh, funeral procession uh, in the history of Waterbury at that time. Um, you know, it just showed the beloved nature of, of Father McGivney and how they recognized their hometown uh, son. So he was buried there uh, in the family plot, which is still there at Old St. Joseph uh, Cemetery. Um, you know, people often ask, I was just asked this last week at Providence College, um, uh, why did it take so long for the Knights to propose him for sainthood? And that's actually something that the Historical Commission, you know, which was formed in the Archdiocese of Hartford, um, you know, looked into and try to come up with an answer because that's, you know, what the congregation obviously in, in Rome would be wondering too, you know, if, if his reputation for holiness was so great, you know, why wasn't there a Santo Sabit, you know, like with John Paul II, like, you know, sainthood now kind of thing, uh, plus among his knights. And uh, the answer, you know, consulting many his historians and church historians at the time was that, uh, you know, the knights were just getting off their feet, getting on their feet, and to propose someone for sainthood, um, first of all, would seem a little presumptuous. Second of all, it would not go well, you know, with the, uh, with the Protestant uh, hierarchy, so to speak, of, of society. You know, oh, you know, they're just those superstitious, you know, Catholics. They probably have a tunnel, you know, underneath their meeting room, uh, you know, going to the Vatican. The Pope's going to come out and, you know, uh, rule from Washington, D.C. You know, all these things. You see cartoons of the time. Um, you know, their lampoon kind of things, but uh, they were taken seriously, you know, that the Pope was going to come one day and uh, proclaim himself, uh, you know, president and, and take over America kind of thing, you know. Um, so that was one reason because, you know, the Knights were trying to, Father McGivney's vision and the vision of the Knights was to bring together the possibility of being a good American citizen and being a good and faithful Catholic. So proposing him for sainthood so early, um, you know, we kind of frustrate the idea of becoming a good American citizen, not that they were denying, you know, their faith or anything, but I guess prudence uh, might dictate that uh, they not do that right then. Uh, another reason is, uh, you know, Rome looked at America as, you know, mission country at the time. Um, you know, a very young Catholic uh, populace you know, you go to go to Rome, as you know, you, you know, you see churches from the 1200s to 1300s, you know, that's nothing. You know, here in America, it's like, well, when were you founded? It was 1776, you know, it's like, oh, well, that was just yesterday, according to the church. So, um, you know, maybe they would not be taken seriously, in a sense, if they were proposing, you know, this, uh, this humble parish priest as, as a saint in the 1880s or 1890s. So that kind of answers that question. Um, but... Uh, he was, uh, the clause was opened in 1997, uh, December 18th, 1997, in the Archdiocese of Hartford under Archbishop Daniel Cronin, uh, still living. I think he's 92 or 93. He came to the, uh, he came to the beatification. Uh, God bless him. He's, he's, uh, he was like the happiest, happiest archbishop I've ever seen, you know, because he was the one who opened this. He was the one who shepherded it. Uh, he let it go when he retired, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, he, he was, it was very good to see him. And uh, so the cause opened, that's when you become a servant of God. Uh, it was an historical cause because there was no living person, so there could be no testimony 
you know, by any relatives or any of his parishioners or anything like that. So it's purely historical, so they had to impanel a historical commission. Uh, I've seen the work, you know, the uh, documentary work of the historical commission. They wrote to every possible place where Father McGivney ever would possibly have been, obviously to all the seminaries, all the schools, all the dioceses, anyone who might have known Father McGivney who went to another diocese and all this, is there anything in your archives that you know, would bear uh, light on Father McGivney's life? And you know, of course, at this point, they're trying to prove his heroic virtue, which would bring him to venerable. So uh, Dominican priest, Father Gabriel O'Donnell, who was resident at the time at St. Mary's, was appointed the first postulator. He had to take a six-month course in Rome on how to be a postulator. Uh, came back, founded the Michael McG the Father McGivney a guild, you know, which I now oversee, and I hope all gentlemen here will, will join. I should appreciate that uh, Father O'Donnell still celebrates Mass every week for all the members of the, of the guild, so all your intentions, you know, will be remembered in, in that sense. Um, so the, uh, the postulator, Father, Father O'Donnell, put together what became 800 pages of documentary evidence uh, regarding Father McGivney. And this included uh, a day-by-day a day day, uh, register of all his sacramental uh, you know, duties that he, uh, that he logged at St. Mary's and at St. Thomas. And it goes on for pages, of course, all handwritten. Um, so that's the thoroughness of, of this process. Um, if I can say anything, you know, as vice postulator, um, you know, and having gone through, you know, one possible miracle that was rejected and another possible miracle that was accepted, um, the integrity of this process is, is great. You know, people think, oh, the Knights have lots of money, they're going to pay, you know, the Vatican and they'll be, no. In fact, we have to watch more than others because to give any scent or hint of, you know, trying to, uh, you know, to bribe our way into it would totally derail the cause, and, and we know that. Um, so it, it's, the, the process is greatly, uh, great integrity involved, and you know, everyone is, is very uh, careful and meticulous in, in this process. Um, so the Positio, as it's called, you know, went to Rome, arguing for his heroic virtue, that he lived the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and the others related uh, virtues. Uh, to a heroic degree during his life. I mean, this has so far nothing to do with his heavenly intercession. Um, so it was studied by the Vatican for a number of years, and in March of 2008, March 15, 2008, Pope Benedict XVI issued a decree um, recognizing his heroic virtue. And uh, totally without warning uh, to us in, in New Haven, um, you know, we actually uh, heard it from uh, someone at AP, you know, who was assigned, you know, AP reporter assigned to the Vatican. You know, he called for a quote, right, from the Supreme Knight, you know. Oh, what do you think about Father McGinty being named Venerable? Do you have anything to say? You know, and the secretary's like, did I miss something? You <laughs> know, and uh, so we realized, you know, like we look on the web and, you know, we see whatever. So, oh, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, here's a quote. <laughs> so... Uh, so then he's venerable, venerable servant of God. And a month later, uh, Benedict, of course, visited the U.S. And uh, in St. Patrick's Cathedral, he had a special mass and, and address to religious and priests and, you know, women and, and men religious and priests. And during that, he kind of reviewed the history of the church in America. And, uh, you know, he, he mentioned, you know, we have to remember uh, that venerable servant of God you know, Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, you know, who through charity, unity, and fraternity, um, you know, influenced uh, the church uh, of the 19th century in America. So that's kind of that money quote that you might see a lot, uh, you know, uh, with, the, uh, with the Knights of Columbus when we talk about McGivney. And then, of course, now he's venerable, and uh, all focus now is on beatification. And what's the main thing with beatification is the miracle. So we had a miracle. Uh, I wasn't there then, but a brother, a Dominican brother of St. Mary's in the 1980s had been in hospice and was healed through prayer to Father McGivney. 
and you're able to bring that forward, even though that happened before uh, the cause was opened, you're able to kind of hold that and bring that forward. Um, it was looked at for a number of years, um, and I wasn't involved directly, but uh, the Vatican, you know, in 2011 said, you know, no, this is not uh, miraculous. Um, so then soon after that, uh, the Supreme Knight called me down and he said, well, I know you have a, uh, I, I know you have a uh, master's in theology. Would you like to be vice postulator? Our postulator in Rome is asking, you know, that we be more aggressive in a sense of looking for possible miracles. And that would mean, you know, you traveling around, you sending out emails, you, you know, doing social media and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we get a report of a possible miracle in the Philippines, and uh, which is fortunate for me, because my wife is, is from Manila originally. And uh, so I got to travel to the Philippines to look into this. It's kind of a crazy thing where uh, fishermen in the north were, in the northern part in the South China Sea, were competing over uh, fisher grounds. They go 12 miles offshore, and they live out there for like a week. And, you know, they have these uh, habitats, as they call them, where they build, but it's actually a net. But it's all, you know, seaweed and kelp and everything. So the fish start to live in there. And at a certain point, you know, they crank it up and they, they bring all the fish in and then they don't go out for another month. Um, but anyway, this one, one fishing guy accused this other guy, Jeffrey, of stealing from him because he was getting twice as much fish. But as Jeffrey said, and, uh, no, 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 I'm just much better than he is, you know. And... Uh, so anyway, the way they settled the score is uh, the, the guy uh, sent two gunmen and shot uh, Jeffrey the fisherman uh, point blank at 13 bullets. And Jeffrey, just a month earlier, had become a Knight of Columbus and he still had his rosary, you know, to get at your first degree back in those days. And uh, the evidence showed, you know, from the x-rays and everything else uh, that there was a bullet that was gonna go, there were two bullets through his neck uh, one from the back and one here that, from all appearances, would have gone through his carotid artery, would have bled to death. But it hit the rosary beads, which, you know, we had the broken rosary beads as evidence. And it put it off course, and it hit, you know, the back of his spine. Thankfully, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't crippled by that. Um, so anyway, that's a whole process. And, uh, you know, the medical commission over there was not buying uh, that. You know, they said, our, you know, I think the, the quote from one of the uh, medical examiners in Rome who was on the commission said, I see people every day in Rome, you know, recover from gunshot wounds such as this, you know, referring to the mafia, I guess, or whatever, you know, the, uh, uh, the killings. So uh, that, very disappointed, you know, was turned away in 2014. And then in 2015, 2016, we received notice that Daniel Shackle uh, his, his wife was, gave birth to a miraculous child. Um, so uh, she was pregnant. This is the 13th uh, child for her. And she, uh, you know, one of her checkups, I think at 10 weeks in probably December of 2014, uh, they said, you know, by all indications from the ultrasound, this child has Down syndrome. And she said, oh, that's great. <laughs> Um, not quite like that, but you know, that's no problem at all. You know, she and Daniel said they knew families with Down syndrome children and they knew they were a great gift. Um, you know, if nothing else, it's a child that will probably never commit a personal sin. So, you know, once they're baptized, they're, they're bound for heaven. And, uh, you know, they had many children in their family and said, you know, it would be good for them to have someone in the family who only can give love, right? That's all that the Down syndrome child can give you know, love, and uh, to be loved and to give love. And so it'd be good for our children, you know, to be, uh, to be involved in that and to develop a greater sense of empathy and, and service. Um, so they, you know, this was a secular hospital in Nashville, Vanderbilt, and, uh, you know, the OBGYN offered abortion. Of course, they turned it down. In January of 2015, uh, another ultrasound showed something more serious, high drops fetal high drops, which is when two or more of the internal organs fill with fluid. And this was the whole child filled with fluid. You see the, the ultrasound, um, you know, Daniel will say, you know, that before ultrasound looks like a water balloon. You can barely make out the features of the face. 
And, uh, you know, of course, the after miracle ultrasound in utero was, you know, just normal looking Down syndrome children, child. Um, so again, they were offered abortion. It's, as you know, like 80, 85% of, of couples uh, who get that uh, uh, Down syndrome, uh, well, that was before, yeah, the Down syndrome abort. But now they're facing, I mean, the doctor said there's no hope. They've never seen high drops uh, this advanced and this serious. And there's no treatment for high drops. There's nothing they can do. They can't give any medicine. They can't go in there with a, you know, with a plunger and, and pull out the fluid or anything. It's just, it either resolves on its own or the child dies. And if he doesn't die in utero, right after birth, the lungs are filled with fluid, he can't breathe, and you know, a short, a short life outside the womb. So again, you know, Daniel and Michelle uh, turned down abortion. And uh, you know, they said, however long God wants us to have this child, we will care for this child and love this child as God's own gift. And, uh, you know, Daniel is a, uh, an agent, you know, insurance agent with the Knights of Columbus. So he was familiar with Father McGivney. The whole family was. They had a home school that was named Father McGivney Home School, you know, long before this happened. Uh, so they knew him very well, and they started praying to Father McGivney, of course, knowing that he needed a miracle for beatification. And uh, Daniel got an incentive trip with a bunch of other um, uh, agents, uh, you know, every year, like the top performing, high performing agents, as Jim used to be an agency, can tell you, um, they get incentive trips, you know, and, and these guys, they decided to go to Fatima, you know, which is not like, you know, you go to a secular insurance company and, you know, they're going to Acapulco or something, but uh, these guys decided to go to Fatima. So, uh, so they go to Fatima and they're still praying, you know, through the intercession of Father McGivney, but also praying to Our Lady of Fatima. You know, here's an interesting fact I learned when I became vice postulator, that um, the congregation, you know, wants to see exclusive intercession, you know, by the, by the uh, venerable person, right? And, you know, if someone in close to the situation, you know, says, oh, you know, I prayed to Father McGivney, but I also prayed to St. Anthony and St. Jude, and said, oh, okay, that's, that's not going to fly as far as intercession. But the Blessed Mother is recognized as the mediatrics of all graces by the congregation. So you can pray the rosary, you can offer everything through Mary's hands because they assume all prayers come through her anyway. So I thought that was pretty cool. And you know, I don't think she's officially been named mediatrics of all graces, but Congregation of Saints considers her so. So, uh, so Mary does not negate any other, any other uh, intercession. Um, so they go to, they go to Fatima and they're at Mass, and Supreme Chaplain Archbishop Laurie at the time is celebrating Mass for the agents, and our chaplain, Dominican Father Kalish, is reading the Gospel for the day, you know, just a regular weekday Mass. And it's John chapter 6, and uh, I think it's chapter 6. Um, but it's the Roman official coming to Jesus and saying, come down, Lord, my, my child is ill. You know, if you don't come down, he will die. You know, and Jesus says, such faith, uh, go home your child will live. And the minute, and they tell this story, and, and they, they testify to this to the tribunal, the minute they heard those words, Daniel looks at Michelle, Michelle looks at him, and Michelle says that like a veil was lifted off her belly, that something, she felt something physically happen within her, and she started, you know, started crying, and you know, people were wondering, oh, why is she crying? You know, what's going on? You know, so they knew she was pregnant. She was obviously pregnant, so maybe they're thinking something's wrong with the pregnancy. And she's going, no, 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 something's right with the pregnancy. You know? And uh, so when they get back to Nashville, um, they, had, they had a regular scheduled appointment a few days later, and uh, ultrasound, and the doctor doing it was a doctor of the practice, but not one who had seen her before. So she's doing the ultrasound and said, oh, well, I guess you know your, your child has Down syndrome. Oh, yes, yes, we've been told that weeks ago. And uh, otherwise, this is the most beautiful baby I have ever seen, Mr. Shackle. It's like, oh, what about the high drops, doctor? High drops? I don't see any evidence of high drops. Oh, wait a minute. Are you the case that we've been talking about in conference, the family with the high drops baby that had no hope? Yes. I said, well, and they said, when we just got back from Fatima, this is a Catholic doctor, 
She goes, is this the miracle we prayed for? Then? He says, I think it is. I think it is. So uh, the child was born May 15th, 2015. Um, medical records show, you know, past history of high drops, no evidence of high drops at birth. You know, and they go through the regular CPAC, whatever, you know, testing all the, all the organs and whatever and taking, you know. So that, that's the miracle that, you know, and that was 2015. Uh, you know, we heard about it at, at Supreme Council maybe a few months later. Um, and, uh, you know, I was told about it. And, you know, I called Daniel and tried to get a little information. And, you know, he was through the moon, of course. Um, and I said, well, you know, we're going to have to wait like six months because, you know, before we really do an investigation because the healing has to be permanent. So we want some evidence that this just isn't, you know, a passing thing. Well, he's not going to get high drops outside the womb, I guess. But, but he had to undergo a, uh, a heart surgery unrelated to the high drops uh, uh, to correct something in his heart. So I said, you know, let's, let's just wait till he gets, like, through this whole thing, and then we'll start investigating. And, uh, you know, you investigate, and then they had a tribunal, uh, you know, in under the bishop in Nashville where doctors gave testimony. You know, and they told them, you don't have to use the word miracle. Oh, no, we're going to use the word miracle. You know, these are like secular doctors. You know, we're going to, definitely going to use the word miracle. We've never seen. And the doctor who had, who had offered them abortion, uh, you know, a lapsed Catholic, um, you know, she said, I now keep at my desk a, uh, uh, you know, a printout that says, there's no such thing as no hope. You know, so she's gone through a very difficult kind of conversion, you know, one of those hound of heaven kind of conversions where, you know, she always prided herself as a, as a woman of medicine, of science, you know, and now she's kind of being drawn back to, uh, you know, this faith that, you know, she thought she had left behind. So, um, so that was the miracle. Uh, it takes a long time, right? So after the tribunal, which took about a year, you know, getting all, every, all the documents together, the medical records, the testimonies, and then it was sent over to Rome, you know, the usual thing. It's, it's kind of cool, you know, you box it up, you wrap it in brown paper, you put the ribbon around, and then, the, you know, you, you melt the red wax on top of it, you know, and the bishop takes his ring and, you know, to assure that, like, it's not open before it gets to the Vatican. Um, and it was sent by a diplomatic pouch out of Washington, D.C., so, you know, it's not open by customs. Um, so, what, that was September of 2017, right? And then they have to uh, commission uh, seven medical experts, and, you know, the Vatican picks the medical experts based on the nature of the case. And uh, so they had, like, OBGYNs and, you know, uh, perinatal experts, and, and they send them the whole documentation, give them three months to study it, and then they convene one day in Rome, and, the, and uh, you know, they put in their votes. If you get five out of seven, then it passes the medical commission. If it gets less than five, you know, they can haggle with one another to see if they can, you know, like a jury, you know, move someone over to the other side. Um, in this case, they got seven, seven yeses on the medical commission. And then all the documents get sent to seven theologians, usually on the faculties of the pontifical universities in Rome. And uh, their main thing is to see if it's truly, they can, they can show that Father McGivney was invoked truly and uh, exclusively. And the documentation on this was like, because, you know, Daniel sent out an email to all his agents and all his clients and all, you know, he used to be grand knight of his council, all his council members and then state deputies picked it up around the country. So they pray, for, pray to Father McGivney for this agent's child. So we have his email going out, and you have like 100 emails coming in. You know, I'm praying for Father McGivney, only Father McGivney. <laughs> and then Michelle, of course, her, her uh, homeschool uh, you know, women, and they're all saying the same thing. So it was kind of interesting. And if I'm going on too long, just let me know. Um, but I'm, I'm almost finished. So, uh, so that went through seven nothing with the theologians. Um, and then I think we're in 2019 now, um, the end of 2019. And, 
then has to go to the cardinals who are on the congregation of the, uh, of the saints and saints causes. And very rarely, you know, this, you know, the cardinals question, you know, the expertise of the two, commis two commissions. So that got approved by the cardinals. And, uh, and then we wait again. You know, there's a lot of waiting involved in this, as you can tell. You know, it's like three months for this, and then another three months, and then three months for that, and then da da da. And, you know, and of course, Rome tends not to work during the summer. So, you know, we have to get three months off for that. Um, so we're into 2019, probably late 2019. And then we get into 2020 and, and COVID, right, in March. So we're saying, oh gosh, you know, all of Rome is, you know, this is never going forward, right? It's like gonna be another few years. Um, but as it turned out, um, the, Holy, uh, the prefect uh, presented the cause, the miracle to the Holy Father, and he approved it on May 26th, 2020. And uh, we, we got word from the postulator like a day or two before, like I, I think, you know, the prefect, you know, you know he gets some inside information. Uh, I think the prefect's gonna bring it, you know, this week sometimes so he'll be on alert. So it's like every morning, like, you know, six hours difference with Rome. Like I'm getting it with, you know, they're, they're usually they present at noontime. So uh, I'm getting up at like, you know, five in the morning for all week, you know, looking at the website, waiting for a phone call from the postulator, you know, driving my wife crazy, you know. Um, so finally we get, uh, we get a call from the postulator, say, you know, the prefect's up there now. And uh, we got word that the Holy Father signed it. And, uh, you know, now the way is open for beatification. So the next question was, okay, a lot of causes have put off canonization, you know, not in, around the world, you know, canonization and beatification. Why? Because they want to wait till COVID's over so they can have a huge gathering, you know, for, for the ceremony. And maybe if it were for canonization, we would have done it. But, you know, when they asked me, oh, it's vice postulator, what do you think? I said, Let's do it now, you know, like the real goal is canonization. This is just a step along the way. And, uh, you know, let's, let's do it in, in the Cathedral of Hartford and, um, you know, so we can begin the next step in the process. So, as I said, you know, it takes a while to organize one of these things, um, you know, and the uh, Holy Father appointed uh, Cardinal Tobin as his representative. Um, and, you know, it was... Uh, my wife got to read intentions in Tagalog, her language. And uh, so little Mikey was the miracle. And what is his name? Mike, uh, Michael McGivney Shackle, middle name McGivney. It goes back to when Daniel, you know, when they, when they were really suffering after that diagnosis and really didn't know what to do. And Michelle had had two miscarriages before this. Um, she actually had 15 pregnancies. And she was on the floor, you know, crying her eyes out, like she didn't want to go through another, another miscarriage. And Daniel, you know, goes into the little chapel that they have in their house, and he promised, he said, God, you know, Father McGivney, if this child is born healthy, I will name this child after you. And originally they're gonna name him Benjamin after a grandfather, but, uh, you know, when they got the healing, uh, you know, of course, they followed through on the promise. Michelle wasn't too happy at first because it was her grandfather. They're not going to name him Benjamin. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's a great couple. I, I was saying just today uh, to some agents who are in New Haven that one of the greatest privileges and joys of being a vice postulator has been to meet the Shackle family. Um, they are an amazing couple. Um, they put everything on the line, obviously, for the faith. Um, you know, they have 13 children. Uh, they accept all the children that God has given them, and uh, they're willing to die, you know, for the faith. So, so what can you do, my esteemed brothers? Um, so there's three things. Uh, you can join the Father McGivney Guild if you're not already a member. Um, you can pray to Father McGivney for any intentions, and I'm sure in your pastoral work as seminarians, you encounter people who, you know, ask for prayer, um, you know, so include Father McGivney in that prayer. 
any favors you hear of in your own life or in other people's lives through Father McGivney's intercession, report that. FatherMcGivney.org website. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, again, people say, well, how, how close are we? Uh, so if anyone is familiar with, uh, with the Guild and get the Guild newsletter, you know that uh, we print favors, usually a page or two pages of favors. You know, some of them, what I call everyday favors, you know, I prayed the Father may give me for a job or a better job. Uh, I prayed for my son to come back to the church and things. But every once in a while we get something like, I had stage four cancer and I prayed the Father may give me when I went for my next CAT scan. The doctor told me this cancer is gone and there had been no treatment. You know, oh, okay. But I tell people, if you, if you see anything like that reported that's published by the Guild, it's not being considered for a miracle because we have better ones in the pipeline. So without giving away any details, just know that, uh, God willing, uh, Father McGivney will be a saint, definitely within our lifetime. So. <clears throat>